and says this. I behold, one came and said to him, Good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? So he said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, and that is God. But if you want to enter into eternal life, keep the commandments. And he said to him, Which ones? And Jesus said, You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, and you shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother, and love your neighbor as yourself. And the young man said to him, All these things I've kept from my youth, what do I still lack? And Jesus said to him, If you want to be perfect, go, sell what you have, give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Let's pray. Father, we thank you uh, for your love and grace. We thank you so much for your word and what it means. And Father, the message that we can find in it. Father, I pray today that because of your word, that Father, you would speak to us. Not only to the high school seniors who are graduating, but Father, to their parents. And Father, to members who've been a part of Central all their life. And Father, people who just came this morning. Just because this morning, Father, you let them here. No one is here by accident. And so, Father, we ask you to do something incredible because you're an incredible God. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, if you see the context of this, this passage, understand Jesus is not having a private conversation. Most of what Jesus did was not in private. He always had his disciples or a throng of people with him that would listen in on these conversations. When people would come to him, it was a very public matter. In Mark chapter 2, you see that Jesus was in a crowd of people, so much so that they had to uh, bury through the roof in order to get a lame man to Jesus. And so everywhere Jesus went, he knew that there were multiple people listening in on these conversations. And so as oftentimes, if you're a parent and you're speaking to one child, ultimately you're saying this to the child that is also listening uh, because they're probably in their other room trying to make sure that later on they get the same special treatment as well. And so Jesus was very purposeful in this message because he's not just talking to the rich young ruler. He's talking to his disciples and to everybody else around him that's within hearing distance. And so as I share God's word this morning, understand I'm not talking to these seniors. I'm talking to the body of Christ. Because no one is left out when God's word is shared. It's applicable at most points for everybody at any one given time. And so as we look through this, understand my first point is this, is how not to go away sad. And understand that that last verse is this, is that Jesus had told him, these are the things that you must do. And it says in verse 22, it says, But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. I'm going to tell you guys this, is that as you graduate and you go on, there's some sad moments. There's the last part of the prom where everybody's taking pictures. There's graduation, and then there's project graduation. And then you might see each other during the summer. But these are probably the most exciting but the most sad moments in your life because I'll probably never see my friends again You've got Facebook, you'll see them all day. Okay? But these are some sad times for some of you, but I'm wondering if there's some sad times for other folks. Because here's what I learned and I understand about this rich young ruler is two things. One, he does this, he built his life on possessions and morality. He built his life on possessions and morality, meaning this is when he was able to come to Jesus, he says, yes, I was able to do this, this, and this. I tithe, I came to Sunday school, I memorized scripture, I prayed for my pastor, and I gave him missions, and Lottie Moon was really excited. I didn't drink, I didn't chew, and I didn't go with girls who do. I protested the right things. I gave to Stalos. God, I'm a good person. I'm not as bad as my neighbors because they stay up till 3 in the morning playing loud music that I don't agree with. He was a moral person. He was able to put some things off on his checklist. But the reality is, in all of those things, he just had medals and awards. Can I tell you, one of my, two of my letter jackets from high school, I went to two different high schools and was able to letter in a couple sports. I never went to college like most of these students that play, play sports. 
But there's two homeless men in downtown Dallas that have my letter jackets. And they're able to claim that they were able to letter in basketball and cross country. <laughs> because in the end, my life has not been built around what, I, what successes I've had and the medals and the awards that I might have been given. But it's about the impact that God has made in my life because of people who invested in me. And now because of that impact, I want to do that same thing for other people. Last Sunday, I was able to baptize my son. And for a lot of you, that is a deep breath moment where you go, oh, my job's done. My son and my daughter, they've been baptized. They're safe. Yeah, that's good. My work's done. But can I tell you that my proudest moment is not going to be when my son is baptized. My proudest moment is when my son comes home from a baseball game and he says, Dad, you'll never guess what happened on the ride home. We were coming home from our biggest rival and we barely beat him in the ninth inning. And Dad, on the way home, I was able to lead my coach to Christ. Because the job as a parent in Deuteronomy 6 is to teach students and to teach children to love God the way that you as a parent has loved, have loved God. And as a grandparent, that you've loved God that way. It's not stepping off a checklist. It is loving God enough that other people around you love God the same way that you do. It's making an eternal impact, not just checking off a checklist. Not just morality and goodness. And so I, I caution you parents that may have recently baptized your students. Your job is not done. Because listen, this rich young ruler was a vocational success. He probably had everything he ever wanted in this world. He probably had two iPads. And every iPhone has. He had phones that talked to him. But he had no impact on the kingdom. Your students may have scholarships to every school in the nation. But if they don't love Christ as a parent, you've not fulfilled your job that God has preordained for you to do. Because the bottom line is, Scripture doesn't tell me that it's my job to minister to your students and to teach them to love God. John and I and Jimmy... And Ilya, our job is to equip the saints for the doing of the ministry. The real ministry begins at home. Amen. And so I want to encourage you not to look at vocational success. Because listen, students, your, your success is not going to be built on how much money that you have. But the eternal impact that you have. And when does that begin? When you're 30 or 40 or 50 or when you retire? It's when students who graduate in two or three years from now look at you guys and go, that was the biggest time in my life is during this senior class's senior year because they ministered to me. And they taught me what it was like to lead on the people of Christ. And so he went away sad. Why did he go away sad? Because understand this, he's meeting with the majestic King Jesus who has authority all over creation. That in everything, it's in His hands. Colossians says this, is that everything was created by Him and for Him and through Him. That in all things, He might have first place or preeminence. That because of creation, if nothing else, by creation, we would be able to see Jesus as Creator King, majestic and holy and authoritative. And so that we would see Him high and lifted up. Why did Jesus die? Not for our sake. Listen, in Philippians 2 says that so he might be glorified and that every knee shall bow and every tongue confess. Why did Jesus die? To glorify himself and to glorify the Father. And so this rich young ruler is not just talking to any old rabbi that's at the synagogue. He's not talking to Caesar. He's not talking to Pilate. He's not talking to a governor or a president or even the best athlete on YouTube. He's talking to King Jesus. And when Jesus tells him, you must sell everything that you have, go give to the poor and come follow me, he goes away sad. Why? 
Because at that point in his life, of all the possessions he had had and all the things that he had, he could not give those up. But this is why it's because he rejected the one king who had authority all over creation and eternity. And do you want to know why people in this world are so mad and so sad all the time? Because the majority of the people that you're around day to day have rejected the one true king. Even believers who've lived with Christ and have said that they're believers for the longest time, if they're not walking with Christ, they're not accepting and trusting and following the true king. So they're sad and they're depressed. But even more so, if you look back in 1 Kings chapter 18, where, where Elijah is uh, doing battle with the Baal prophets, it's an interesting passage. It's in 1 Kings chapter 18, verses 27 and 29. It's one of the most interesting passages I've read uh, that really says why our country and why our, our world is what it is. 1 Kings chapter 18. You see this battle going on between the prophets of Baal and, and Elijah, the prophet of God. And it says this, verse 27, And so it was at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud, for he is God, meaning Baal. Either he's meditating, or he's busy, or he's on a journey, or perhaps he is sleeping and must be awakened. So they cried aloud, cut themselves, and was their custom with knives and lances, until blood gushed out of them. And when midday was past, they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. But there was no voice. No one answered. No one paid attention. I would venture to say that ESPN doesn't listen to you. I would venture to say revenge doesn't listen to you. I would venture to say that the majority of the things that you put your hope, trust, and obedience and allegiance to don't listen to you. I love Sports Center. I do. Sports Center has never changed my life. Sports Center has never given me hope or direction in my life. God's word, God's people, God moving in my life has given me all the direction I need. He's the only one that listens. There are times where my phone is off and my wife will call. I'm not listening then, but you know what? My God, my Savior, my Jesus will always listen to my wife, even though there are days where I can't or I won't or something happens and AT&T has shut down. And I'm going to tell you, the reason why people are so sad is because their God does not answer them, and He doesn't listen. Jesus, in the midst of all that's going on, and everything that went on, He listened to the rich young ruler as He came to Him in this crowd of people that He's speaking to. What does your God do? Does He listen? Or does He come and involve your, Himself in your life? The second thing is this, is which ones? Because the rich young ruler asked Jesus, which ones must I obey? What things must I do to continue on my checklist? If I've been this good, how much do I need to do just to get by? I mean, how many of you in college looked at your syllabus and thought to yourself, I need to do this project, this project, and this project, and I don't have to do this project because all I need is a C in order to graduate Okay? Because C equals certificate, right? And D is for diploma. Okay? That didn't apply to me. I actually made great grades in seminary. I, I applied myself far better than I did in college. But how many take God's word and say, Jesus will always be with me? And then when Jesus says, go and serve the poor, we're like, well, I can't do that. How many of you, when you go to dinner somewhere, the first thing you do is turn to the back of the menu. Because you know what's on the back of the menu, right? It's the good stuff. It's the stuff with chocolate or apple or dumpling or fried or ice cream or bluebell. Can I read you something real quick? Ultra rich flourless chocolate cake to die for. Served with a hot flowing melted chocolate center. Oh. That sounds good. I mean, how many of you would just, if I could do it right now, I could just go, that, and y'all would go, yes, but you'd have to do it before you. Good. But you know what this is called? Applebee's. It's 
So when you go to Applebee's today, please don't order this, and this is why. It's called Deadly Chocolate Sin. But it's $2.79. But it's filled with chocolatey goodness and flourless, rich sauce. But we take God's word like that. Oftentimes we take things out of context. The promises in the Old Testament, that's Old Testament that were very specific to Old Testament characters and historical figures may not apply specifically to us. Or we take things out of context, or we don't even read the whole passage. We don't read from the capital letter to the period. If you read Paul, basically that's an entire chapter because he writes in run-ons. Take all of God's word, not just part of it. Jesus here is saying, don't just take part of my word. Take all of it. Follow me. He's not just saying, just do the first four commandments and leave out the last six because this guy already had the last six commandments down to a team. But you can have the last six commandments and miss the first four and miss eternity. Because the first ones, first four deal with our relationship with God, the next six deal with our relationship with people. You can be as nice as you want to to other people. You can even smile at the lady at Walmart. But it does not necessarily mean that you love God. Or that you genuinely love that person to the point that you want to share the gospel with. So oftentimes we take things out of context. We barely get by to fulfill God's ultimate design purpose. How many of you, did, when you graduated high school, you set up for yourself these specific goals in your life? You said, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do this. And I've challenged our seniors for the last few years to ask God what He would want you to do. As opposed to throwing your hands up and going, I don't know what I want to do. I don't even know if I want to do anything. I think I'm going to stay home and I'm going to play on Facebook until I'm 38 and then I'll graduate. But what if God has something so much better for your life, even at the age of 48, 59, 92, that God has a better plan for your life now than you ever have for your life? And what does it take? Exactly what Jesus told the rich young ruler. Sell everything you have. Give to the poor and follow me. And so ultimately we need to understand this. To go away. But go away sin. What was Jesus asking this rich young ruler? A couple things that I want to be very specific in him, him saying to this man. is Number one, he's telling this man to love other people. Love other people. You see the way Jesus loved people? For three and a half years, he lived with people. He had community with people. If you want to love your neighbor, spend time with your neighbor. If you want to see your son or daughter come to Christ to be baptized on a Sunday morning, spend time in God's Word with your son or daughter. Love people. Not just when it's convenient, but maybe when they are struggling to the ends of their rope and be there to pull them back. Disciples that are in our lives as well. And that person maybe you think will never, ever, ever, ever come to Christ, don't give up on them. Jesus died for them as well. There's not a person in this room who is worthy of being given up on. Love them. Second thing he said was this, is to trust me. John 3.18 says that we are to believe in him in order to be saved. That word believe is pastua, which means to entrust oneself to. When you said your vows, you entrusted your life to your spouse. You didn't just say, hey, I believe in my wife and I know she's there. But there's a life-changing event that happens when you say, I believe and I entrust myself to my wife. When you entrust yourself to Jesus, it's not just saying, forgive me of my sins because I don't want to go to hell. It's saying, trusting you and giving you my life because you are my Savior and you are my Lord and my Master and my King. He's saying, trust me because when you sell all your possessions you give to the poor, you don't have anything of your own. All you have is me. I was speaking at a camp this last summer, and it, and it dawned on me that um, 
I need to pray differently before I spoke every, every service. And I started praying these prayers regularly as I would get up to speak. And even now on Wednesday nights, and every time I, I get an opportunity to share God, God's Word, I say these things to God. I say, God, I need you because they need you. And whatever's going on in this building, I need God more now than I ever do. Why? Because I need to entrust myself to Him. Because He's called me to sell everything, give to the poor, and follow Him. It means I need to trust Him. Follow Him means the disciples immediately they got up and went. And like the sign on the church said last week, we owe more to Christ than just morality. We owe Him our lives. We owe Him our allegiance in our workplace, in our families. In our activity on the internet that maybe our wife doesn't know about. We owe him everything. I think that there are times where we feel like maybe we get off scot-free because we look at the scriptures and it says give a tithe at 10%. And my understanding is that the scriptures goes a lot further in the way that we should deal with our money. God has given us grace and so that we need to give in the same manner in which we've been given. And so if Christ has given us His life, we need to give Him our lives and everything in it. Not just a monetary donation from time to time. He says, follow us, or follow Him. We often think that if we are moral, God will bless us. That if we think at the end of the day that we've been good enough, that nothing bad is going to happen. At the end of the day, if, if we come to church on a regular basis during a particular football season, maybe God will shine upon my particular football team. Or if I pray long enough, or I go to church during those particular times, then I won't have uh, difficult times in my life. And if you look at the life of Paul, he was probably one of the most faithful followers of Christ in the New Testament. And the Word tells us he had the most difficult time of any of the disciples. God's not your spiritual good luck charm that when you're at the end of the day and you go, God, I've done these things. Pay up. And I venture to say most of us don't say that, but we live out that. Because, hey, if I've been good, God, come on. My kid needs a scholarship. We've been in church since they were in kindergarten. God. God says, I'm not about giving scholarships. I'm about giving eternal life to those who will trust, follow, and obey. So the question remains for me is this, why did he go to Jesus? Why? I think in all of us, we know and understand that there is a God. Scripture tells us this, is that, that people know. That it's been revealed to us through nature. Romans chapter 1 says it. So that man is without excuse. We all know that there's a God. He saw something in Jesus that was incredible. Even the Pharisees says he spoke, speaks with one who has authority. So they knew that there was something special and unique about him. But there's something in me that wants to drive home the point of this. Is that Jesus is the authority of all creation. For him to come to Jesus and they say, Jesus, you have this authority to give me eternal life. It means this, as he understood Jesus was the king of all creation. And at that moment, the reason he was so sad is because he walked away from the king of all creation. The greatest thing in all of history, he stood in front of. Three years ago, I stood next to Kevin Durant. He kneeled, I stood. He was still much taller. I was in awe of how tall he was and how great a basketball player he was, but there was no life-changing event. When I, when I left, I was like, hey, that's cool. I got a picture with Kevin Durant. A couple of our students got a picture with Jason Terry uh, back in September. They were really thrilled because they were like, man, he's, he's like six foot two and I'm almost as tall as he is. But it was no life-changing event. Jesus, when you meet Jesus, you will either go away sad or you will go away in awe. The 
Pharisees went away sad and mad. The disciples went away with eternal life because they followed him. Because they saw in him, you have the words of eternal life. John 6 says, to whom else will we go? When we get the accurate view of who Jesus is and who God is and his eternal purposes that he has set out since before time has began, we will follow him. It will be a life-changing event. When you lift up Christ in your own home, things will be different. When you lift up Christ in your workplace, when the thing that you speak of most is Christ, there will be a change in the atmosphere of the things around you. Because Christ has entered the presence of that moment. And because of the power of His Word, His Word never returns void. And so why did He go to Jesus? Because He's King. And when we see King and Jesus lifted up, the world gets changed. And there's going to come a day where Jesus comes descending from the clouds to take us home. And that's when the glory of God will be revealed in a way that we've never been able to see before. Scripture alludes to it and gives us hints. But I pray each day as you open up God's word that you get a bigger and bigger picture of who Jesus is. Because when your picture of Jesus is, your fellowship becomes more committed. And strengthen, and there's a foundation of King Jesus, and that's who I'm following. Not just some rabbi, not some teacher, not just some man in a book that was written 2,000 years ago, but the King of all creation. And that's who the rich young ruler came to, and that's who the rich young ruler went away sad because he rejected him. There's three options today. One. There's a good chance that you can go away sad today. Because the glory of God is in this room. God is here. So there's two or more gathered. There he is. In the midst of believers' hearts, he is here. So if you're a believer, he's here because he's in your heart. And so there's, there's this opportunity for you to meet Christ this morning because he's spoken to you through his word. And to reject that means you go away sad. The second thing is this, you go away and you never change. Nothing's different. Nothing's impacted you. You'll keep on doing the same thing as you've always done. Getting the same results you've always got. Or the third thing is this, is what the disciples do. They give up everything and they follow it. And that's where eternal life leads. It's fellowship. <coughs> it's not obedience. It's love, trust, and fellowship. And those things lead to obedience. Because we trust Him. And where He says, go, we go. And says this in God's Word. The truest way to not go away sad is this. It's to trust in the name of the Lord. In Him there is salvation. In no other name, Acts chapter 4 says, in no other name but the name of Jesus. So I'm going to pray. I'm going to offer an opportunity. Brother John's going to come up and he'll greet you. And if today, for some reason, God has spoken to your heart, there's an opportunity for you to come and pray with him and to say, I've never trusted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I don't want to go away sad today. I want to know that my security is in heaven. I want to know that my security is in a relationship with Jesus Christ. Or maybe you need to restore commitment. And you can come down here and pray. Or maybe this is where God has led you. And you say, I want to place my family and my faith and my commitment here. And I want to join. And I hope John will be able to share with you how you can do that. But at this time, let's stand and pray. And then as God leads you, I hope that you will follow him.